Okay, I guess it's one thirty, so we'll get started, and uh, people can join in as we uh, we get we go along. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Martel. It's a real pleasure to see you. Um, I'm co-director of the SECAMOD chair, and this is a very first timer for us. This is the first time we organize a webinar. Uh, as I'll, you'll see in a minute, we have many activities. We used to organize an annual workshop, but given the sanitary crisis, that uh, it's almost it's now almost impossible or very difficult to organize. So we've decided to uh, move on to a webinar uh, format. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, what we do in the chair, uh, we the idea is to promote research in asset and risk management, and particularly on, on ESG investing. Uh, this is a focus we, we've reinforced uh, with the renewal of the chair last year. The chair has been existing for five years now. Uh, so we try to promote research on, on ESG investment. We produce a series of research letters on ESG issues. Uh, we organize an annual workshop and now a series of, of webinars, uh, which uh, are related to the chair's topic. Uh, obviously, we may come back eventually to an annual workshop, but the most likely we'll keep the series of webinar, which is, I think is a quite useful tool to uh, get the academic researchers uh, together and, and share their work. Uh, we also offer a series of seminars on asset and risk management, and we offer scholarships to PhD students working on ESG topics. So we're very ESG oriented, and uh, that's why we're glad to have you today discussing uh, the topics related to ESG. So I'm Justin Martin, I'm co-director. Uh, there's also in the chair, Philippe Itzorbid, who's the uh, senior economic advisor, who's co-director on the AMODI side. Uh, there's Sophia Ramos, who's there, uh, who's academic advisor and professor of finance uh, at ESSEC, and v uh, Vanessa, that uh, many of you have, have been in contact with, uh, who's the chair assistant. So today, we have a nice, very nice program uh, on green finance. As I said, this is our first webinar, and so we're happy to have uh, three presenters on uh, to discuss green finance issue. So the first presentation is by Anders Andersson from Swedish House of Finance on climate fears and the demand for green investment. That will be followed by a presentation by Stefano Ramelli from uh, University of Zurich uh, on low carbon mutual funds. And finally, by a presentation by Miguel Duro from ESA on the big three and the corporate carbon emission around the world. The uh, structure is simple. Uh, presenters have uh, presenters have uh, 30 minutes each to present their work. Uh, then we'll have 10 minutes discussion, uh, questions from the audience. So don't hesitate to uh, turn on your microphone when you want to ask a question. Uh, and uh, we, we can discuss these papers one after the other. So first I'll leave the floor to Anders Anderson, who's going to present his paper on climate fears and the demand for green investment. Anders, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Uh, let me see if I can share my slides. So this is a paper um, that I've been writing for some time together with my longstanding co-author, David Robinson. He's from uh, Duke University. And uh, just to begin to set the stage, uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Uh, let me just briefly begin by discussing how I think finance has been addressing the, this demand for green investments. So first, there is a literature that rationally motivates people to hold portfolios, either because that they provide a hedge uh, against adverse climate events in the future, or uh, one can think of sustainability uh, to be a priced factor uh, to, to enter the portfolio allocation problem. So, and the second reason I would call value orientation. And here people are tilting their portfolios towards green investment because of their conviction or preferences, or they just want to signal to others that they belong to this group. So many of these papers I, I, I cite here, they find that beliefs of uh, uh, climate change are not primarily driven by knowledge, but by cultural value orientation. So now obviously this second category could, could in many cases, of course, give a motivation or why the first approach is meaningful because it provides some sense of micro foundation for why people have preferences for green investments. Now, I, I would place our paper in a third bucket I label cognitive limitations, uh, and these would be behaviorally uh, motivated. So we know that people in general know little about finance and that self-confidence in knowledge is important for engagement. So this is a 
project I, I had bit with David and, and, and a third core author uh, before. Um, and, and there's also evidence that attention and saliency are important factors that guide people into financial decisions. So sustainable investments can, can, can also outperform uh, other investments uh, in that some of these factors may be overlooked. Uh, so these, uh, these things would be, would be evidenced by, by, for instance, Alex Edmonds' work uh, when it comes to, to firms that have social responsibility uh, 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 outperform others, or or the Holm and co-author paper that uh, find, finds that uh, that firms exposed to drought risk uh, generate higher returns. Uh, so in that sense, I, I think these papers also belong to to the third category. Now, now to motivate uh, more specifically, uh, I think that financial decisions has increased in importance over the years since much, much more responsibility has shifted from governments and, and firms onto individuals. And there's a widespread concern, uh, not only by, among academics, but also by practitioners that some individuals are sort of ill-equipped to take these decisions. So that's one motivation. The, sorry, the second one is that I believe that sustainability actually adds some complexity to uh, the retirement savings decision problem. Because mutual funds already have many characteristics to consider, so adding yet another dimension makes it harder to choose. Secondly, I think if you compare sustainability and retirement savings decisions, they, they, are, uh, they share some similarities. So both of them play out uh, over a long time. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, noisy feedback and, and, and it's infrequent and it's quite difficult to reverse or correct past mistakes. So uh, finally, taken together with the fact that what we find in some related work that environmental engagement is so much higher than financial engagement, we, we just believe that the scope for, for these behavioral mechanisms to, to play out are, are fairly large. Uh, so there's a well-known feature that uh, people overweight rare and disastrous events. Uh, so this all come from the framework of seminal papers of Kahneman and Tversky. Uh, and these types of effects are also been shown to be uh, exacerbated by, by saliency and fear. And now I'm, I'm referring to a literature which connects psychology, economics, and finance, uh, which originates from, from ideas from George Lowenstein. So for, for the roadmap map for, for my talk, uh, I want to continue a little bit more explicitly how we motivate our paper by explaining the exact empirical setting we're working with. Um, I will then explain the survey uh, and the pension choice data that we use and how we match them to our survey along with detailed administrative data from Sweden. So as you can hear now, we're, we're in, in, in Sweden where Big Brother sees you. So what we do here is that we ask people things in a survey and we are ac actually able to match uh, the survey evidence directly to register data with actual choices. So that's the plan. Uh, I have a good 30 minutes to talk today. So I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm going to be able to finish. But in case I don't, I'm just going to highlight our three main uh, results. Uh, so so uh, we basically have three sets of results. So first we find that fears of future environmental calamities is what drive people into hold ESG funds. Um, we find this effect for people who hold and trade into all or 100% ESG portfolios and not only for those just tilting some of their holdings into ESG, sort of dipping their toe into the water. Uh, we also find this to be the case after a large nationwide weather shock, but we don't find evidence that this took place before this weather shock. Now, the second set of results uh, is that we link this to personal climate calamities uh, to the extent which people were exposed to these shocks with the help of local uh, weather data. And the third set of results uh, shows that um, Climate calamity sort of ignites a, a call to action. And so it's not particularly related to finance, we believe, but to a more general uh, green behavior. 
uh, as we measure that by, by self-reported recycling behavior and their willingness to pay more for, for green products. Uh, so that's in a nutshell, the outline of my talk. So let me now uh, guide you through uh, the empirical setting. So uh, the, the Swedish pension system was launched in the year 2000. And uh, essentially what was new here is uh, one introduced the premium pension, which essentially takes two and a half percent of the gross wage and allocates it to an individual account. So this is similar to a US 401k account and uh, investors or pensioners here uh, are able then to invest the funds uh, into uh, a very um, uh, large set of menu of funds. And if they don't make an active choice, uh, they automatically fall into the uh, default fund. Now the default fund also applies SRI, uh, but this fund can't be chosen um, but I will, uh, in the most of my talk, I will refer to these people who made an active choice uh, because it simplifies matters, but we also come back to this issue uh, for people that uh, fall into the uh, default fund. Now, uh, this is then a graph that shows you the development of the fund offering in Sweden. So this has been documented before by Thaler and Kronqvist uh, that when the system was launched, there was something like 450 funds to choose from. And this has more or less exploded over the years. So at the end of our sample period in 2017, the set of possible fund choices was, was almost 900 funds. Now, uh, the second thing to note here uh, was that in 2004, the Swedish government introduced a, a little green flag uh, to put next to the fund uh, in the fund catalog. Uh, which would indicate that uh, this fund had a, a social uh, responsible or, or environmental uh, sort of profile. Now, uh, this type of profile, profiling was not government sanctioned, but rather uh, this was a self-selection uh, or self-certification mechanism in which the funds that did want to apply this flag also needed to explain this to the investors and communicate in which way they followed or adhered uh, to these guidelines. As you could see here, when this system was introdu introduced in 2004, only 7% of all funds um, applied it. Uh, in 2014, uh, this number had doubled, so 15% of all funds uh, used the uh, ESG flag. And after that, uh, it doubled again in only uh, three years, so in 2017, more than one third of all funds in the system uh, were labeled as ESG funds. Uh, the second thing to note with the labeling is that not all funds that come in are new funds, but there is considerably uh, a considerable amount of relabeling of funds. So the shaded green area shows you the number of funds that used to be something else, but then adhere to ESG principles. So that's a substantial fraction and in 2017, as much as two thirds of all the green funds uh, are actually relabeled re -labeled funds. Now this is a little um, problematic for us because we also know that uh, there's a lot of inertia in the pension system. So we don't only want to capture that people just happen to fall into a green fund, uh, but we also want to capture the fact that people actively choose uh, to, to uh, invest green. The second piece of this graph is the dotted line uh, that would trace out the number of high temperature records out of 100 weather stations in Sweden uh, measured uh, from the beginning of the last century. And as you can see, there's a spike in 2014, which is something that we're going to utilize in this uh, uh, paper. Uh, and that was uh, an extreme weather shock uh, and, and heat record. Um, uh, amongst 47 out of 100 uh, weather stations. Right. Uh, in sample then, so this graph then shows you uh, the wealth that is built up with, amongst the 3,667 investors we have in our data uh, from 2004 and onwards. 
uh, where the green shows you the amount invested in, in ESG funds, the gray uh, in other funds, and the white uh, part of the bars are the uh, investments in a default fund. So approximately, approximately one third of all investments uh, is in the default fund, a third uh, in, in, in uh, ESG funds and one third in, in, in other funds as of 2017. What is interesting, I think, however, is to see the uh, active allocation towards green investments. So if you take the lightly shaded green versus the lightly shaded gray, you see the flows or rebalances going from uh, investments um, from uh, the into green funds versus other funds. And that actually outpaced uh, regular funds as of 2017. So more than half of the rebalances went into ESG labeled funds in 2017 compared to other funds, which is then greater uh, than the sort of number offering that I showed you in the, in the graph before. Now to give you a sense about the weather shock, this is just a, a six, uh, uh, plots of, of, of Sweden and average temperatures in the month of July. And as you can see, 2014 uh, really sticks out. It was by far uh, the hottest summer uh, in many years. And there was also other dramatic uh, weather events happening at the same time, which is quite unusual to Sweden. And also with this respect, uh, this drought that is heat caused was also um, said to, to, to contribute to one of the worst wildfires uh, that the country ever experienced since the 1950s. So this was by all means a, 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 a volatile weather year, even though I'm not a meteorologist or a weather expert, this is so much I can say about that. All right. So, uh, I'm now uh, done with the empirical setting, you know, a little bit about the pension. Now I want to turn to the survey and, and what we actually do. So uh, we sent out a survey to 20,000 people through Statistics Sweden, which is the corresponding US Census Bureau. Uh, so in this letter, uh, there was a mailer with instructions and a link to website. So we received a very high response rate. So something like 4,000 people responded. And after we matched to all our registered data, we had 3,667 uh, people remaining in the sample. And the survey contains three different types of questions. So uh, at the center of this paper is climate calamities. We also ask questions about green, green household behavior and green finance. But then we also ask questions about financial and environmental knowledge, uh, but this is uh, all analyzed in another paper, which I'm not gonna talk about today. So how do we measure future environmental calamity? So we ask people within the next 20 years, how likely do you find the following scenarios? Uh, we have one question about temperature rise. Uh, so, um, so the statement is the average temperature on earth rises by more than one centigrade. Uh, if uh, uh, shortage of food will increase and uh, a statement about the world sea level rising more than one meter. Now, the horizon uh, on which these events will play out is fairly short, it's 20 years. We deliberately ask this because we think that we want people to envision this within their own lifetime. But if you look at scientific consensus, uh, these are all actually quite unlikely uh, events. So for instance, for temperature rise, um, we know that uh, uh, it has been maybe one centigrade uh, or a little more since the beginning of industrialization or an average of 0.17 centigrades per decade. So thinking that uh, a rise of one centigrade in only 20 years is a fairly pessimistic uh, uh, assessment. Same thing about food shortage, uh, we argue, because in general, uh, undernourishment and hunger is something that is decreasing in the world, uh, but it's shocked by uh, conflicts uh, or natural disasters. So in that way, uh, we also believe that this is a, thinking that this is very likely something that is connected to have a, a, a negative view of, of global warming. And finally, the sea level question, one meter in only 20 years 
is actually very far out of the uh, most pessimistic general consensus estimates. So what we do is that we create a dummy to equal one if you think that any one of these uh, scenarios are very likely. So that's our, our proxy for, for uh, uh, climate fears so and environmental calamities. I have a few slides I'm going to skip here with just to verify that you know, uh, these are indeed uh, uh, um, pessimistic estimates, uh, but uh, I think uh, we can... Uh, just the question, so the, the yeah. questionnaire was just these three questions or more questions in the same kind of... And so for the calamities, these are the only three questions that we ask. Okay. Now, okay. And gonna, you have more. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And now I'm going to turn to some additional questions. We we'll, we'll also ask about green behaviors and green finance. Okay. So we have one question about recycling. So the question is: I recycle a great deal more than my neighbors. So 15% uh, strongly agree to this statement. Only 7% disagree. So this is, of course, an unreasonable cross-sectional result. But psychologists. Uh, usually attribute this to over placement or a better than average effect. Nevertheless, we, uh, we use strongly agree uh, to this statement as a proxy for the disposition to take uh, uh, sort of action uh, in your household. We also ask a question about the willingness to pay more for green products. And as you can see, 30% or a third of all Swedes uh, strongly agree to this statement. Now, we also have two questions about green finance. We ask people if uh, they think that uh, uh, sustainable investments generate higher returns in the long run. And we have a question about fees. I'm willing to pay higher fees for a mutual fund that only make environmentally friendly investments. So here you can see that people are not agreeing to the same extent. But I think maybe it's more interesting here is to see that uh, a lot more people uh, actually tend to respond, don't know. And we take this or interpret this, that uh, uh, this is a, in, in effect of, uh, an effect of, of, of financial literacy that you have a, very, uh, a much more difficult time to assess whether these statements are true or not. All right. Now for the premium pension data, I'm, I'm not gonna have time to go through this in detail, but uh, we have about one third of them in the default fund. Uh, but we have uh, two and a half thousand that have opted out. And uh, for all of these portfolio holdings, we create three dummy variables based on the intensity of ESG investments. So some ESG is a dummy that equals one if you have a non-negative weight in ESG. So just a positive weight in your portfolio. Remember you have uh, a possibility of five different funds in your fund portfolio. Most ESG is a dummy uh, that equals one if you have a majority of ESG funds in your portfolio, over 50%, and then all ESG, which is a 100% uh, ESG portfolio. So we're going to use this to see if we uh, can create some tension in the results when we uh, make this analysis going forward. So in the interest of time and not uh, you know, boring you too much with tables that I, I just think, think I need to say one thing about our sample. So given that statistics Sweden does this for us, we know, we actually know the underlying population, right? So what we're gonna be able to do is that we're gonna create sample weights so we can correct for the fact that we're under sampling uh, specific groups here. So if you compare the first and the second column, you see that we're under sampling young people uh, and we lower income. And also actually it's true for lower education. It's just that I, I cut the table off in half here. And that's gonna be important, right? Because what we find also with climate calamities that, it, that it's predominantly females, younger people, people with lower income, uh, and also to some extent, lower education that uh, uh, expose these fears more than others. Uh, so, so, so that I think uh, uh, makes it important to take this into account. Um, so the funds, they are classified as ESG, but not like they don't have a label for green, right? That's true. That's, that's correct. But although in the name, if they could be, they could have green on the name or, you no know, uh, green or, you know, for instance, was something about water or renewable. Um, I think we tried that. Uh, there were not too many of them. 
But okay. I should also say to my defense that the social, um, oh, sorry, the, govern, the, the governance uh, part of it is not uh, part of, of the official labeling here. It's the environmental and the social concern that gets into okay. the label. So ESG is a little bit redundant talking about these funds. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so let me just walk, I, uh, I have five minutes left, so I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through our main results. Um, so, so this is then a, uh, the first test where we just look at the portfolio at the end of 2017. So the first four columns would be the holdings, what people had in their portfolios at the end of 2017. And we look at the, these dummies, if you had some ESG investments, most over 50% or all 100% ESG portfolios. You see that you have some you know, weak, uh, there's a weak relation that climate calamities loads significantly positively uh, on the most and all category. Now, if you include the full sample, the, the also the uh, a default fund, which is an ESG fund, you see that the climate calamities become stronger. But then um, it's difficult to, um, to think about this if it's actually a, a passive active choice that you go into the default fund because you think it's green or it's just because of inertia. We believe that inertia is the uh, main motivation why people fall into the default fund. And you can also see this on the loadings that it switches to be, become negative for, for income, age, and you're more uh, positive related to, uh, to females, people who typically fall into the default fund. But nevertheless, climate calamity seems to be important for the category that do indeed fall into the default fund. Now the pattern becomes much more clear if we just focus on, on trades. Like I said, there's a lot of inertia, so not, people, not many people trade, but 382 people traded in 2017. And if we look at the trades instead, uh, we get much stronger results. So people who generally tilt their portfolios uh, to ESG uh, are those that expose these climate calamities. Now the second piece of result is that we wanna connect this then to the uh, climate uh, shock that we, that we saw. So what we do then is that we, we look in a panel. So we look at all years from 2012 to 2017 uh, we have yearly dummies, and then we define a dummy after the heat wave, which would take the value of one for 15, 16, and 17. And then we interact that dummy with climate calamities to actually see uh, whether these uh, things were more important uh, before versus after the, the, the heat wave. And look at again at the, um, sorry, the, the uh, uh, right hand side of this table, you see that they're all significant uh, uh, and even more so for, for the more concentrated uh, portfolio holdings. Uh, and these results tell you that uh, they were not important before the heat wave, but they seem to be very important after the heat wave. So this uh, takes us in, uh, back to the, to the climate shock. Uh, so, so what we want to do now is to relate these climate calamities uh, to weather exposures. So first of all, we use the weather stations, but we think uh, a more salient shock is the class one and more severe class two warnings in the area. And specifically, the prediction would obviously be that if you're exposed to a class two, that would be um, much more salient than a class one exposure. And we can also look at the type of warnings that you're exposed to. And there's several caveats uh, of, of, uh, of doing this type of exercise. So first of all, you know, Sweden is not that a big country, right? So you have national media channels. So the 2014 wildfire, for instance, would be all over the news. Uh, so presumably whatever we find uh, would be uh, sort of tainted by that. Uh, we also have limited spatial variability because we only have uh, these warnings defined on 21 counties but the granularity of, of the observations on individuals uh, is, is much greater. And then we have this general problem that two thirds of the population lives in the southmost one third part of, of, of its area. So all of these three reasons, I think, would, would make it more difficult for us to find anything when it comes to this type of analysis. But still, uh, we actually do. So in this analysis, then when we try to explain calamities, 
we see that temperature records, uh, you know, is mildly significant, but the uh, weather warnings uh, are actually quite significant. So, uh, and it's the class two warnings that seem to uh, be fruitful in explaining calamities, uh, but not the uh, class one warnings. And then we introduce some dummy variables. So in the dark green area of the country of Sweden, you can see on the left, that will be the north part of Sweden. Uh, so that's a dummy equal one if anyone lives up there. And then we have a separate dummy if anyone lives at the coastline of Sweden. And we find that people living up in the north are much less likely to, to have these climate calamities, whereas people living at the, uh, you know, along the coast uh, increase. Still, the, the warnings seem to be uh, uh, significant. And now we, in column four and five, we just slice up the, the warnings that we have, uh, the class two warnings. And uh, we can indeed see that you know, heat and, and, and wind and thunder seems to be stuff that increases the propensity uh, to, for climate fears, but snow actually decreases it. And this holds up also when you control for these uh, geographic uh, uh, dummies that we have. Now, my final piece of uh, results, and then I'm going to conclude, I see that I ran out of time, is that uh, when we connect uh, climate calamities to these green household behaviors, we see that they load very significantly on them as well. So this is what we mean by climate calamities inducing a call to action. So it taints not only your household behavior, but also actually what you think about uh, investments going forward. And interestingly, the last four, uh, columns four and five shows you that this willingness to pay, high, pay higher fees actually survives if you control for the fact uh, that these people also have higher return expectations. So it's not pecuniary motives that drive people uh, or uh, be willing to pay higher fees. Now to uh, conclude on a broader scale, our results relate to a recent US study uh, where people were asked what factors made them change opinion about climate change. And the number one reason for doing so uh, in this study was recent extreme weather events, followed in third place by personal observations of weather in one's own area, which we think was uh, interesting. And more specifically to conclude this paper, we find evidence from Sweden that volatile weather events in 2014 affected attitudes towards green investment and that people exposed to extreme weather believe that future environmental calamities are highly likely even if scientific consensus, consensus might say otherwise. So these people shifted their investments into ESG funds after these events, but not before. And we think our results are helpful in understanding the mechanism in which green investing is related to self-experience, uh, the strong reactions we see to ESG rankings, and more generally how green investments are priced as a function of investor demand. So with this, I thank you very much for your kind attention and I open up for any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anders. Uh, any question from the audience? Okay, I may start with one. Um, one thing I was wondering, your, so basically your experience is, is relative to a, uh, a calamity which happened in 2004 in Sweden, uh, 14 in Sweden. Uh, now, of course, people, you can think people would be affected by that because that's close to where they live. But I presume that Swedish have televisions just like French people. They watch news all over the world and their calamities are rising all over the world at some point in time. Um, how can you control for that? I mean, how, because these year results seem to suggest that what happened in Sweden was a, you know, had a big impact. But maybe it's due to the fact that, you know, these calamities are adding up and people are getting really concerned. So uh, is it really due to a Swedish effect or to a global effect? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. I think uh, obviously we're all uh, affected by these horrible pictures we, 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 we got from Australia, for instance, uh, uh, last winter and so forth. But I think the assumptions that we make here is that that's a sort of, um, an exogenous effect that, that is a treatment for everyone and it's not necessarily related to the area where you lived, where you had the uh, calamity or weather events that we are 
um, investigating in our regression, right? Mm. So we think about yoga, for instance, uh, that people in the north uh, expose uh, less fear for, for adverse climate effects, whether it's people uh, during the, uh, along the coastline does. That type of, of reasoning would suggest then that the, these geographical instruments need to be correlated then with the media uptake uh, for mm. the rest of the world, which they might be, right? We don't know, mm. it could be. Um, but um, uh, I do think that I was surprised that we actually found uh, these strong effects from, um, from local weather shocks, despite the fact you have all this noise in the background that could potentially drive uh, mm. all of these. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Good question. Other questions? I have another one then. Uh, why I I'm trying to what's your standard? Why you think these people are willing to pay higher fees for asset managers? In a sense, you would please you'll you're pleasing asset managers, and <laughs> you're basically saying these guys are willing to pay more. You can charge them more. Uh, what's your sense of why they're willing to pay more in terms of fees for asset management that follow these ESG rules? So. so <clears throat> In our companion paper, uh, we, we consider green values, not so much calamities. Um, one possible uh, motivation for this is that people uh, have a, um, get a green value. They have a green value conviction that might stem from calamities um, that we don't know. But given that you think that going green is the right thing to do, that seems to spill over into many domains. Uh, of your of, of your life, so not only in your consumption of in the product market, but it seems to spill over also to to the financial market. So in that respect, you can maybe uh, uh, think that uh, investors might be a little bit naive in that sense, right? They, um, and we also have evidence that uh, there's very little overlap um, between financial and environmental knowledge. So there's all almost like they're in separate silos. Uh, so, so, so um, environmental concerns are more related to disengagement in financial market than engagement. Okay. Marie has a question. Hello, Marie. Yes, hi, very nice presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. I was wondering because I was quickly looking at the a map of uh, po political votes in, uh, in Sweden. I was wondering how much uh, are these uh, calamities in Sweden correlated also with political opinions? There might be like a north-south divide uh, also mm -hmm. in uh, political opinions. C can you tell us more about that? And that might yeah. also affect uh, investment choices in green assets, right? Yes, that's very good. Actually, we, we do control for uh, the proportion of green votes uh, in, in, your, um, uh, in your area. So that variable is a control variable. It doesn't come out very significant very often though. Um, but, uh, and I think one problem with it is that it's quite correlated also with just with general uh, density. So sometimes it, it, it's difficult to disentangle whether you live in a, in, you know, in, in a big city or if you're in a green area. Uh, so these type of effects seem to be, uh, um, uh, well, hard to disentangle because the correlation is just very high. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, so I guess we'll stop here. Well, thank you very much, Anders. Uh, next presentation is by Stefano Ramelli. Yes. Just a second. Okay, I hope you can see my, my slides. Thank you for, uh, thank you to the organizer for, uh, for uh, the invitation, and I'm very happy to, to be here. I'm, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the paper Low Carbon Mutual Funds, and this is a joint work with uh, Marco Ceccarelli and Alexander Wagner, uh, both with me uh, in, uh, in Zurich. And uh, this paper has been uh, out for, for a while, but we are still work in progress. So um, we are working on a revision. What I'm presenting you today are the latest version uh, of our analysis. A bit of 
as a motivation for our study, even though perhaps uh, this is not needed given the topic uh, of the webinar, one of the long-term uh, goals of the Paris Agreement is making financial flows consistent uh, with a low carbon uh, economy. And the way we interpret these uh, goals is uh, that the main strategy of policymakers is to increase the level of uh, climate-related information available to investors, hoping that this will uh, trigger a virtuous cycle. So investors with uh, more information on uh, climate performance will be uh, better able to express their preferences for climate conscious uh, products. And these in turn will uh, urge uh, financial intermediaries to also uh, change their offering and therefore move away from uh, the status quo. That is actively move, uh, shift their portfolios away from uh, uh, the current market portfolio, at least what is uh, the current uh, market valuation. So this, uh, virtual cycle, this mechanism makes sense in theory, but there's still uh, little empirical evidence that uh, it is at work. So what we want to do with this paper is test uh, uh, this mechanism focusing on mutual fund industry, uh, as you will see both in Europe and the US. And the mutual fund industry obviously represents a large share of uh, global asset under management. So it's, uh, it's very important. The way we are conducting our peak analysis is basically by exploiting uh, a quasi-experimental empirical setting. That is the release in April uh, 2018 of a new uh, eco-label on the platform uh, Morningstar, which is the most important platform for mutual funds. So in April, at the end of April 2018, Morningstar introduced this eco-label called Low Carbon Designation. And which is uh, a label meant to easily identify funds uh, aligned with the transition to a low carbon uh, economy. So the release of this label has some uh, uh, nice uh, features for an empirical studies because it was released as a surprise to and was applied to a different uh, range of uh, funds uh, uh, worldwide. And also, obviously, there, we don't have a self-selection of funds into this label because it was assigned by Morningstar uh, to mutual funds based on uh, two criteria, two absolute uh, criteria. Well, the, the first is having a carbon risk score below 10 out of 100. And the second one is having a fossil fuel involvement uh, below uh, 7%. So these two criteria uh, in the paper and also in this presentation uh, are taken as, as given, but let me just explain you what they are. Carbon risk score is a score uh, considering both of the firm's uh, activities and policy. So it's somehow similar to an ESG score, but uh, uh, focus on, uh, on uh, climate change. And while the fossil fuel involvement uh, score is simply the asset weighted uh, share of the portfolio, invested in, a, in a firms uh, related to fossil fuel activities. So in order to get uh, this label, mutual funds have to satisfy these two criteria. And uh, importantly, we want to stress that this label, uh, the low carbon designation is positively but imperfectly correlated with already existing uh, ratings on Morningstar. In particular, is uh, not perfectly correlated to the traditional morning, uh, morning stars, stars, which capture uh, firms' uh, performance and uh, quality in general, and the sustainability globes uh, ratings that have been studied by Hartman and Susan and other papers, uh, which are more focused on uh, the generic sustainability performance of the fund, so the DSG score of the fund. Uh, this label that we are studying here is focused on, uh, on, uh, on on carbon, uh, on carbon performance of, uh, of funds and uh, also funds with uh, one or two globes or one or two stars can and uh, do obtain, can in some uh, obtain this, uh, this label. So the research uh, questions in, in these studies are, are three, basically. First, we want to study what are the main benefits and costs in investing in uh, these low carbon funds. Second, 
we are interested in investigating um, whether investors reward these uh, low carbon funds. And finally, we also want to study whether fund managers uh, actively respond to the climate preference of their clients uh, by actively shifting their portfolio towards more towards lower carbon uh, firms. So just to give you a preview of the results, we find that these low carbon funds uh, have a special uh, profile in the sense that they have a trade-off, they present a trade-off between uh, edging uh, climate related risk on the one hand and, uh, uh, and min uh, minimizing, uh, maximizing diver diversification on the other hand. But despite this uh, trade-off, we find that investors strongly reward this type of funds. Uh, um, so in particular, we find, just to give you a takeaway number, a premium associated with uh, this label equal to around 23 uh, basis point in higher uh, net flows every month. So this is uh, an effect that is uh, economically important. And finally, we also find some uh, evidence that after the release of this label, funds that were not considered low carbon um, act actively adjusted their, their portfolios somehow uh, to respond to the revealed climate preferences of, uh, of mutual fund clients. I will now tell you basically more in details how we arrive at these three uh, messages. So we uh, started by downloading uh, information on all European and US uh, mutual funds. And for the sake of comparability of our funds, we drop uh, pure fixed income funds, sector specific funds. And we, we decided to focus on 20 major uh, categories of funds, uh, both equity and diversified. And uh, we left with around uh, 13,000 uh, funds, uh, 19,000 base, base um, domicile in Europe and 4,000 uh, domicile in the US. So here I reported some summary statistics of our main variables, but uh, let me just mention that uh, this LCD here is a dummy variable equal to one for funds that in April 2018 obtain uh, this, uh, surpri this by surprise, this uh, uh, new eco label, the low carbon designation. And as you can see, the mean is uh, 0 0.18 mean, meaning that one out of five mutual funds obtain this label. So the treated group is quite uh, important and, uh, and uh, uh, yes, quite, quite important in terms of uh, number of, uh, of funds. CR and fossil fuel are the two criterias, criteria underlying these, uh, this label. And uh, flows, uh, obviously is monthly flow, uh, net flows uh, accounting for uh, uh, the, the funds uh, returns, which is one of our variable of, uh, of interest, as you will, uh, will see. Okay, I can uh, uh, then jump in uh, the first building block of our paper, of our uh, results. What are the benefit and uh, cost of investing in uh, low carbon funds uh, compared to investing in conventional funds, but also more generic uh, ESG sustainability funds? So one of the main uh, advantages that is claimed uh, very often in research and also in practice about green investing is their ability to edge uh, climate risk, as also we um, under uh, mentioned is in his talk. So a natural question is, can these low carbon funds help to ensure against uh, climate change risk? Here I wanted just to, to mention that uh, climate change is a very unconventional risk. So with long-term fatal properties, so uh, it's, very, it's very difficult to qu uh, precisely quantify the benefit of low carbon funds with respect to this risk. Why? Because, uh, the, the, because uh, extreme uh, climate events are still to materialize. So they lie ahead of us. And so we cannot analyze the, uh, yes, the, the uh, the data for the last 10, uh, 10 years and uh, expect to capture the ability of some funds to, to edge uh, um, climate change. But what we can do to at least get a sense of the benefit of low carbon funds in this respect is to compute uh, the sensitivity of uh, individual funds performance to 
changing changes in uh, perception of climate change risk. And in particular, what we do is to compute uh, this perception, this uh, sensitivity uh, against uh, variation in negative climate change uh, uh, news. And here we use the index used uh, in uh, Angle uh, at all. So what they do is to compute the sensitivity of firms performance to negative climate change uh, news. And uh, what we do is the same, but at the fund level. And what we, uh, what we find, and here in these, are, these graphs are being a scatter plots of uh, individual funds climate betas, more, more precisely loading on negative climate news against the two criteria underlying this label, uh, carbon risk and fossil fuel involvement. And what we find is that low carbon funds, so funds with uh, lower carbon risk and lower fossil fuel involvement have a less negative loading on climate news. In other words, they outperform when uh, the negative climate news factors uh, hit. And this is perhaps not surprising because these funds underweight sectors and, uh, and firms that are more likely to perform uh, poorly when there are more concern on uh, climate change. What is maybe more surprising is that we don't find any relation between the climate betas as we computed, uh, computed it and the generic uh, sustainability globes uh, ratings. So this is, seems to be a features of low carbon funds, not of uh, ESG or globes uh, uh, funds in, uh, in general. Do uh, these benefits in terms of uh, management of climate risk uh, uh, come for free or do they imply some uh, sacrifice uh, for, for investors? Here, the theory suggests that one of the one uh, major cost of these funds may be in terms of diversification opportunities because uh, the economy, unfortunately, is not yet at, the, at a low carbon state and therefore deciding not to invest in, low car in, uh, in high carbon activities uh, may imply the uh, giving up some uh, diversification opportunities. So to uh, illustrate uh, the potential relevance of this cost, what we do is to compute individual funds idiosyncratic volatility, or in other words, diversifiable risk. And we do that by, uh, uh, by uh, collecting the standard deviation of uh, monthly residuals from a pharma French three factor model regressions. So in other words, for each fund, we compute the volatility of returns that could be avoided by investing in uh, the market factors. Uh, the market uh, portfolio. And uh, what we find is that low carbon funds, so again, funds with uh, lower carbon risk and lower fossil fuel involvement, display higher idiosyncratic risk than funds that are closer to the market portfolio. So you can see it in these uh, business scatter plot graphs. So this is pretty uh, maybe trivial and mechanical, but since these funds uh, uh, decide not to invest in certain sec sectors, they uh, give up, they are less diversified than uh, the market portfolio, and therefore they have higher idiosyncratic uh, risk. Again, when we look at the relation between idiosyncratic risk and GLOBES funds, we don't find such a strong uh, relation. In particular, uh, investing in uh, high GLOBES uh, fund, like four funds with four or five globes doesn't mean necessarily having a statistically significant higher idiosyncratic risk. In fact, what we see is that uh, low globes funds have higher idiosyncratic risk. And this is uh, confirmed also by, uh, by other, other studies. So to uh, sum up what we are trying to say here is that with low carbon funds, investors or in other words, with low, carbon, with low carbon funds easily identifiable, for instance, through a label, investors face a trade-off between minimizing idiosyncratic risk on the one hand and uh, investing in line with a low carbon economy on the other hand, for risk uh, management reason, for edging uh, climate change, but also for uh, uh, responding to specific uh, climate conscious preferences, of course. Uh, and uh, this trade-off seems to be specific to uh, low carbon investing and uh, not not, uh, it's not the common features of uh, SRI 
uh, in general. So the question that we, we pose next is how do investors respond to this fundamental um, trade-off? Here, uh, let me stress that um, this uh, question is much less obvious than with traditional ESG investing, where basically investors are, uh, are told that they can have the cake and eat it too, because uh, uh, the, since uh, ESG investing traditionally is based on best in class approach, uh, in, they don't, ESG funds don't necessarily imply uh, higher idiosyncratic risk because they can maintain a sectoral composition as, uh, that is similar to that of the market portfolio. And in the- Stefano, can, I, can I interrupt? Just coming yes, back please. to this question. Please. So in your comparison, did you compare with benchmark or not? I did not, because- no, we, uh, uh, no, well, well uh, the idiosyncratic risk is based just on uh, on uh, the market factor in the US and in Europe. But then when we run regression results that I haven't shown you, but I just show you the graph for illustrative purpose, we control also for a category fixed effect for other for okay. other uh, things. But it was very difficult to uh, really retrieve the exact benchmark followed by okay. each fund. But in terms uh, of alpha, you did not find anything. That, that's the... In terms of alpha, we don't talk about uh, alpha, but uh, we find that recently the these low carbon funds uh, perform better than the other funds. But uh, uh, still, the idiosyncratic risk is. Uh, uh, because is, I'll uh, guess in this regression that you apply to compute idiosyncratic risk, you also can get the alpha, right? Yes, 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 we, we compute but you the, didn't... the alpha. Yes, we, we didn't uh, look at that uh, uh, intentionally, in a sense. We just wanted to focus on uh, on uh, uh, on uh, idiosyncratic uh, idiosyncratic risk. Obviously, the economy is moving yeah. towards a low carbon economy. So, uh, some, some sectors, like the IT sector, is in recently has performed particularly well, and the energy sector has performed particularly poorly. Uh, so that's uh, that uh, speaks in favor of uh, this fund out to performing. But still, they uh, they uh, they have they are less diversified, so they may expose investors to yes some uh, some other types of uh, of risk. Because you could understand these funds like an active style of uh, management. Exactly. And then also, a tracking error will be a measure of these uh, active active uh, active style, right? Yes. And you could also get the alpha. Yep. Okay. Then. Uh, yeah, and just to compare the performance. Yes. Okay. Um, so what we we do next uh, is just to 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 study the the reaction of mutual fund investor to the release of uh, this new label, the the LCD, and this graph summarizes summarizes our funding for the European uh, the European uh, sample, and we see that before April uh, two thousand eighteen. Uh, the, what I'm showing here is the average net flows in uh, uh, low carbon and not low carbon funds. So these two group of funds based on the initial release of uh, this label. And we see that before April 2000, uh, 2018, these, the, the average flows in these two groups of funds were very similar. In fact, the two lines are moving uh, moving uh, together. But after this new label was introduced, uh, the, the group of low carbon funds started experiencing a, 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 a clear increase and persistent also increase in uh, monthly net, net flows. And this is uh, the picture for the US. It uh, looks uh, different, but substantially uh, gives the same message. So before April 2018, uh, as low carbon funds were experiencing lower uh, monthly net flows, uh, but the two lines were moving pr pretty much uh, following parallel trends. And after April uh, 2018, so after the release of this label, low carbon funds experienced a boost in their monthly uh, monthly flows. So what we, so this is basically uh, our message in two graphs, but we also run a formal, uh, obviously regression results where we control for a bunch of uh, fund characteristics and we cluster standard errors properly. And the coefficient of interest is the different difference uh, uh, interaction coefficient between 
the dummy variable low carbon uh, designation LCD equal to one for funds that obtain this label on April 2018 and the dummy variable post for months following uh, the shock. And what we find is that low carbon funds enjoy an increase of uh, uh, around 22 basis points in monthly flows. And this is highly statistically significant, but also economically important because when we compound this monthly effect, even just through the end of 2018, uh, it is equal to roughly an increase of 2% of asset under management for these low carbon, uh, low carbon funds. And uh, our results are robust to many different uh, specifications uh, that I, I will not mention in more details here. Uh, another feature that help us uh, identifying the causality of the fact is that this label is updated on a quarterly basis. So every quarter, uh, Morningstar uh, um, updated this uh, LCD based on the new, under, the new values of the underlying criteria. And therefore we can see every, every time this label is updated, some downgrades, some upgrades, and, the, and obviously the majority of uh, funds have this uh, label confirmed, okay? And uh, so we can study the effect of these uh, 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 label upgrades and label downgrades. And uh, what we find is that uh, basically, sorry, uh, the LCD downgrades are associated with uh, a decrease in uh, net monthly flows, while uh, an upgrade, so receiving this, uh, this label is associated with uh, a boost in, uh, in flows in the uh, following months. So the effect that we identify is not just a one-shot effect of the initial release, but it seems to be something uh, persistent, okay? So what we, uh, what we found so far, uh, if I can summarize is that a significant share of investors have like uh, low carbon uh, low carbon funds and are ready to reward mutual funds to uh, pick mutual funds that have the, even just a simple a simple uh, eco eco labels that, that are meant that are uh, recognized for their climate climate friendliness so the next question that we, we ask is, do mutual funds uh, managers, or mutual funds in general, react to these revealed preferences? Because for instance, the paper by Kruger, Sauter and Starks on the uh, climate, uh, uh, on, the, uh, the, uh, on institutional investors and how they, they face, uh, they, they face uh, climate risk or they consider climate risk, is a survey and uh, it covers around 30-40% of, uh, uh, so 30-40% of uh, the respondents are fund managers. So in a sense, fund managers also care about, uh, about climate risk. So we would expect uh, mutual funds uh, managers to pro also respond to this new information and progressive, progressively shift the portfolio toward, toward uh, lower carbon firms. So this is what we, we study and we uh, adopt again a different different setting, but focusing on funds that were not treated at the initial release of the label. So funds that had a portfolio uh, that was not considered uh, low carbon. And what we find is that from April 2018 through September 2019, so here we extend a bit our sample period because we have quarterly observation, active funds, that were not low carbon, reduced their carbon risk by around 0.61% and also their fossil fuel involvement by 0.50% uh, more than funds that were already considered low carbon. And these results is robust, also controlling for variations in the underlying uh, prices. So it's not due, this effect is not due to changes in uh, weight of individual firms. Okay, and we, we check that by benchmarking the two underlying criteria we are studying with uh, the uh, criteria of uh, index and uh, closed uh, inde index funds. Okay, so I forgot to mention that for this analysis, we explicitly focus uh, on active, uh, active funds only. 
So funds that are considered active, that have an active share more than uh, 60%. Uh, so we conclude that these improvements in climate performance is seemingly due to active trading decisions. So the mutual funds industry as a whole seems to progressively underweight uh, dirty firms and overweight uh, uh, cleaner firms, uh, seemingly also as a response to the preferences of uh, uh, mutual fund clients. Um, let me conclude. What, what are our main contributions in our opinion? First, we want to, uh, want to uh, illustrate the special profile of uh, low carbon funds. Uh, differently from conventional funds and differently from ESG generic funds, these funds can help investors edging climate risk in addition to responding to their non-pecuniary preferences uh, potentially, but this comes at the expense of higher industry risk. So in a sense, we are asking and uh, policymakers are asking investors to give up uh, uh, short uh, diversification opportunity in the short term, at least as long as the economy is still not yet low carbon, uh, in order to somehow move the whole economy toward uh, a low carbon path. However, despite this fundamental trade off, so despite the fact that low carbon funds are not superior uh, in all uh, uh, dimensions, investors express a strong preferences for strong preference for for low carbon funds and also fund managers seems to re, to be responding to these revealed preferences of uh, of of their clients uh, by uh, adjusting the portfolio in a low carbon way we may also draw some uh, practical implications but well, for fund managers one simple one simple implication is that climate responsibility is a key competitive edge in the, uh, in the mutual fund industry, especially for active funds, as uh, uh, Sophia said before, because uh, it allows them to uh, compete for a pass with passive funds, uh, despite perhaps a, a lower return uh, or higher fee. And the, there might be implication also for policymakers because we provide insights on the fact of eco-labeling schemes in reorienting capital flows. Some may be desired, uh, desired uh, effect, like, uh, uh, like the redirection of, uh, of many capitals toward low carbon uh, activities. There may also be some potential drawbacks in terms of uh, uh, under diversifications of, uh, of these funds. So I thank you very much for, for your attention. I think I'm good on time. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Thank, thank you. you very much. Very interesting presentation. Uh, questions from the audience? Okay, yeah. so, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, so thanks for a very interesting presentation. I, I just had uh, uh, basically two questions. One, one was about the diversification. So, so I, I completely agree that you want to uh, if you want to disentangle how um, idiosyncratic risk differs among a set of funds, I think uh, it's natural to do what you do. But but then in your conclusion, uh, one of the main takeaways was that, was that investors sort of needs to give up some of this diversification. And then I started wondering, uh, is that the correct benchmark then? Because given that you're a mutual fund investor, you might always need to invest in some mutual fund, right? You can't really invest into the into the, the market itself. So would that be possible? Or is that something that you thought about to have like the uh, a, an index fund or a value fund or whatever that, that replicates these factors to, to sort of mimic the uh, portfolio universe that uh, this, these investors uh, can manage? Um, and then I had uh, a second point, which I now forgot about because I talked so much. Okay, I'll, let, I'll start by replying to your first point and uh, you have time to, to recall the second point. Now, yes, you're, you're perfectly right. What we do is uh, to compare the idiosyncratic risk of the funds included in our, in our, in our samples. So there are funds uh, that are more diversified. So it, presumably also more passive funds may be more uh, diversified than, 
these uh, active low carbon funds. Okay, so uh, in a sense, we are comparing uh, between funds in our, in our uh, universe, in our sample. Uh, having said that, I, uh, I perfectly agree with you. What we, because we don't know, let's say, what are the uh, options uh, invest, the investors are, are facing. They may be just uh, maybe just be in undecided between a low carbon funds and another funds with the same idiosyncratic risk. So that's true. What we what we want to claim very very frankly is that uh, differently from uh, the Globes funds or with ESG, when we talk about green, the low carbon investings, we are asking investors to make a decision that is more difficult. Okay, so because uh, we cannot sell these funds as a win-win things like, okay, you can invest sustainably and also have a higher return, low, lower risk. Uh, this is what happened with uh, like ESG and the Globes. But with low carbon funds, we have to say them, you, you, you have to renounce to invest in the energy sectors. We may auto perform next year, maybe still profitable. So the, the test uh, that we do is a bit more challenging in addition to the fact that Globes were already there. So investor uh, had already some means to self-select in some funds. So that's another hurdle that we, we face. Yeah, so it's uh, great. I, I, now I remember my second question, if I may. So, so I apologize for, for my ignorance now of knowing how Morningstar works. My, my recollection is that you, they have a, a one to five globe ranking, uh, but it's a relative uh, scale, right? So, so they, the reshuffling that we see uh, means that if you if some uh, um, funds get upgraded, they also downgrade some funds. Yes. Which, which, which sort of makes me believe. If you're talking about then, if I'm if I'm not classified as one of these guys, and I'm 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 a mutual fund manager, and I want to get into this uh, uh, classification, it means essentially that I need to think that I outperform the mean of everyone else if I'm going to be successful in attracting more flows, right? Is that the game? It's not that I only need to have the classification. I, I think I need to think that I'm, I'm better than everyone else, no? Exactly. Now that's uh, perfectly true uh, on uh, the globes. The difference with uh, uh, between this label we study and the globes is precisely that this label is assigned based on the absolute criteria, at least, and fixed criteria so far. So uh, uh, funds just need to underweight, undervalue, uh, underweight, sorry, uh, high carbon firms and can get this label. In fact, we see a uh, progressive increase in the percentage of funds with this label. At some point, Morningstar will have to change the criteria, but these features of this label allow us to study how uh, fund managers change their, change their portfolios uh, over time, uh, presumably also to get, to get this label or to respond to the climate preferences. So uh, while with the globes, we cannot do this exercise for the reason you, 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 you just said, because these are relative measures. So there are always 10% of funds with five globes 10 with one globes. Yep. I get it. Thank you. Uh, Stefano, I had a question. I was wondering where this, this change in flows between uh, lower carbon fund and, and the other funds. Uh, I mean, is it a one to one matching in the sense that do you know if the flows, the additional flows going to low carbon fund comes from the high carbon funds that people are really dropping? Or does it come from their general investment? Uh, because you could think, you know, you're saying uh, one of the problem with the with this is that you get uh, you have a higher idiosyncratic risk by you know specializing in these low carbon funds. But on an investor's point of view, I could have a fund of fun. I could say I'm putting some, I'm driving some money in the low carbon fund, but I'm keeping another fund which is you know could be the index or uh, some benchmark, and I'm reducing my risk. So I give the impression of transferring my money to a low carbon fund, but I'm still managing my risk on my side. Yes, no, no, I, you're perfectly, you're perfectly uh, right on. So there are two points. So I will start by replying to the, the second point. You're perfectly uh, right. We cannot observe uh, the funds portfolio of investors. So it may be possible that some uh, investors like low carbon funds for edging the risk 
of other funds, mm. right? So uh, if I understood correctly your, yeah, your, your right. point. And uh, we see that the, the effect, even though uh, I'm not showing uh, here some uh, cross-sectional heterogeneity, but uh, the, bunch, the, the majority of the effect we document comes from retail uh, funds, especially in the US, not institutional investor funds. In Europe, it's more balanced. And this, uh, well, we interpret this cross-sectional heterogeneity by saying, yeah, maybe this, uh, if the effect comes from uh, households, retail investors uh, who don't have many, who don't hold many funds, they may just hold a few, few funds. And the first uh, question, yes, we unfortunately, uh, yes, we cannot really measure measure uh, that. So we can measure uh, whether these inflows come at the expense of uh, outflows uh, from other types of funds. Uh, why? Because this is just a, a label for low carbon funds. It would have been nice to have a brown label mm. for uh, dirty funds, uh, which mm. It's a nice debate, so I don't know why they don't also include a, a brown label for funds with higher high carbon risk and also perhaps higher idiosyncratic risk. So mm. these are the funds that really investors should avoid, right? Yeah, because they, yeah. they, they're really bad on uh, all circumstance, they all respect, but they, uh, they decided not to, to do that. They just introduced this uh, label for low carbon, low carbon funds. Okay, other questions from the audience? Uh, Stefano, yes. Hey, yeah, Stefan. Okay. okay um, um, you know, great paper. Um, I I have a question. There is a moment in the presentation that you say that the the can low carbon funds help to ensure against climate change risk. Uh, uh, it was a little bit a little bit for me confusing. I, I I wasn't sure whether you were talking about you know physical risk, regulatory, technological risk, transitioning risk. So because. Yes. I was, it was not clear to me that you could really hedge against physical risk well, as, uh, as an investor. Yep. Yes, what we, we, uh, yes, what we use obviously is just a uh, uh, oh. negative climate change news index from Angle et al. And uh, this paper published recently in Review Financial Studies. Uh, well, they also don't know whether they are talking about physical risk, transition risk, and they discuss that uh, in, their, in their paper very transparently. So I cannot give you an answer here. Uh, but uh, still, this, is, this uh, negative climate change news may be driven by transition risk, for instance, a regulatory boomerang uh, in the, the US after, after Trump, or can also due to higher concern for climate change due to uh, extreme uh, weather events, right? So, uh, so may, 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 may not, maybe we are not talking about extreme physical event, sorry, uh, physical uh, climate risk, but we are related to risk related to physical impact of climate change. So there are two different things. It's related to un uh, Anders uh, the presentation of things. So you may have, uh, an extreme uh, weather events and these that give rise to, uh, to, to an increase in the climate awareness in a sense, mm -hmm. and underperformance of some sectors with, so it's- uh, Thank you, yeah, sounds good, okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, last you, question. Uh, maybe I had one little comment this if I know, because there's uh, something I think, which is very important in your paper is you're talking about the uh, preference of investors and how this sheds upon the choice of asset managers in selecting their, their, their assets. Uh, I'm wondering to what extent uh, sometimes the relationship is not in the op opposite direction. What do I say this? Sometimes I look at funds, not necessarily carbon funds, but funds in general, ESG funds, and they make a list of things they don't invest in or like sort of sense stocks, which many times seems to me orthogonal. There's a list of things in there, which I don't see how they're correlated. And I, it's difficult to think that all of this would come from investors' preferences because they're so far from each other sometimes that 
uh, you know, sometimes some of them are even orthogonal. It, I don't even see the link between these two. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to say that, you know, uh, by observing what people do on the financial markets, uh, else really reveals their preferences. You know, sometimes someone may invest in a fund, for example, which doesn't invest in airline industry, and that same person flies over and over. And so I'm not sure what it means and reveals in terms of preferences. So uh, I think it's it's a complex issue, but uh, and I think there's work to be needs to be done on this because uh, it's a really important issue. But uh, so I'm I'm wondering sometimes if if these factors are not imposed by asset managers rather than a, a, a revelation of it or reflection of the preferences of investors. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you, you may write, what investor may look is just uh, the label or the idea of investing sustainably p- 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 perhaps, but uh, um, so the, yeah, the link to personal uh, preferences, personal value, that's, uh, I agree with you, that's, uh, uh, very, uh, it's a bit uh, unclear from this study. I mean, from uh, uh, from surveys like uh, under uh, surveys, or one can maybe look at the correlation between the perf- uh, like investment choices and personal behavior. That's that's mm-hmm. very very important. So here in this paper, we talk about preferences more to emphasize that the traditional portfolio theory. Uh, assumes that any deviation from uh, the optimal portfolio is somehow mm. an error or is uh, naive or uh, mm. it's uh, not legitimate in, in finance, it seems. But uh, when we introduce uh, like uh, preferences for uh, some type of product, like climate conscious product, either pe- for pe- pecuniary or risk management reasons, then we may have uh, different, uh, ec- let's say, different uh, optimal portfolios, one for mm. one class of investors. Uh, but there are papers, theoretical papers, that they are trying to rebuild uh, portfolio theory, also accounting for ESG preferences. The Pastor et al. paper, Pedersen uh, recently, and et al. Uh, in the JFE. So it's an interesting, uh, very interesting uh, debate. And uh, I think uh, there, will, there is a, lo- a large room for uh, more research, more papers. So. Indeed. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next paper is by Miguel Duro from uh, ESA. Okay. I think we are. Everything, everybody sees that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so I like this conference style. Uh, I was, I mean, storyline. I was, I mean, we have a starting saying that the investors. Uh, have bought this idea of the of, of this reality of the climate change and uh, act accordingly. Then we have moved that the mutual funds, uh, you know, uh, basically try to label this, you know, try to move to more green funds, and the more transparency, the better. But uh, and the problem we have is, I think, the, a little bit of the question that you were asking before, Jocelyn, which is this idea that Luigi Singales was asking. You know, we have to be careful because. We may not like, you know, some type of dirty companies, but the problem is someone else can like it. If we just vote with their feet, that's okay. They don't care. They will still continue to basically uh, hold those companies and we will not solve the real problem, which is the, the carbon emissions. So uh, you, you can believe that there will be, a, you know, pretty much a coordination across all the countries at the same time uh, that will solve the problem, but you know has, that hasn't happened yet. And we have been witness of the biggest, you know, pandemic, you know, shock in the history, at least of the of the last, you know, uh, century. Um, and you know, the the more you see about it, the more you see that there is not so much coordination. So, and um, and the and the and the risk are realized in a very short period of time. Even people ne- negate and they are negationists. They you know other people die. No, I don't believe it. Okay, so you imagine when we deal with a you know long fat tail type of event, huge coordination cost, huge winner and losers. So obviously uh, we have to do something not only about you know changing a little bit the, the you know the label. Or the or the tilt of the mutual funds, we have to really reduce the the carbon emissions, which is pretty much uh, the idea uh, we are you know doing in this paper. 
with, uh, I mean, we're studying this paper with, which is co-authored with other, uh, with Athar, Kadach, and Orma Zabal uh, from ESE. Um, and the idea was, you know, for me was, uh, I have to admit, uh, very striking this idea, like, you know, this big three, big, I mean, this big uh, asset managers, uh, when, you know, when we say big, we mean, you know, seven trillion asset. I mean, we know these guys, very passive investors. Uh, they are pretty much investing in index funds and ETFs. Uh, at the same time, they're saying that they're, you know, they say they're doing stuff related to carbon emissions. So for me, it was weird. Uh, most of the people I, you know, I have come as, across when I was presented this paper, don't believe it. They say, you know, this is greenwashing. You know, don't believe them. So my question is simple. I mean, very simple question. Do firms reduce CO2 emissions under the influence of the big three? So do the big three do something really about it? And, you know, does it have any effect at all? Um, and the context, obviously, you know, we know what is the best way to go. I, this is not something, this is not re really rocket science. We, I mean, we have a little bit of a cap and trade system in, the, in Europe, has not been working very well for the last years, but you know, the last, you know, a uh, few years, a little bit better. We have something simpler with, you know, P Pigovian tax. Um, you know, the problem is the tragedy, the tragedy of the commons, okay? Um, so we try to think about, you know, whether investor can play a role. Um, let's get a little bit of context uh, for, you know, at least what is the people thinking in academia, not only people in academia, also, you know, there has been a huge debate, uh, the FTC, European Commission, the SEC, uh, discussing these guys, these three guys. Um, um, you know, Beck Chuck, I, I think, has been much better than, than us uh, selling the idea that these guys can, can't do anything at all. You know, they basically, you know, they do, you know, they defer everything to the managers. They don't have too much incentive to do anything at all. On the other hand, one, one of my co-authors uh, had the, the opposite idea, like uh, this guy has so much power that they're really, you know, ha having anti-competitive effects. Um, and some other, you know, basically some other informational um, uh, frictions, right? Um, but as I said, I think Beckchai is, is winning the, the battle, you know, big time. Also, you know, Be uh, BlackRock is also helping them a little bit, I have to admit. Um, so these guys, these big three say they care. You know, we perhaps we don't believe, or we, we, I mean, we, we don't know if what is the sign behind the climate change, but you know, at the end of the day, a lot of regulation is gonna happen. I very likely, because of regulation, a lot of technological disruption. Okay, the last letter from Larry Fink was really a little bit more threatening than, than, than ever. In the near future, and sooner than most anticipate, there will be a significant reallocation of capital. That's gonna mean winners and losers, okay? Um, uh, they say they care that we have engaged with over 200 companies on the topic multiple times. Uh, even, you know, you see in the news, Siemens has been rebuked by BlackRock Still, you know, some people say, you know, they do little or nothing. Uh, you know, Al Gore, which is, you know, a controversial figure, but, you know, they say they're trying, they're not succeeding yet, okay? They are doing a little bit, but not much. Uh, and the question everybody has is, why would they do it? Why would they do it? Well, this is externality. And some people, if you believe that climate change, I don't believe it, but my, my, my co-authors believe that climate change uh, affects firm valuations in the, so it's priced. Uh, if you believe that, you know, it's something, you know, you may, you may care about this. Also, you know, this, uh, this other idea of heart and singales, this is, you know, remember, if you have a problem of poverty, the companies don't have to do anything about it. You have to give the money back to the investor and the investor will donate to, to fight poverty. What's the problem with this? The problem is, you know, once, once you do that, there is no, there is no possibility to, to reverse the emissions. So obviously that mechanism is not really working. Um, and you know, some people, um, some people believe that, you know, they are basically, you know, a lot of clients care about, you know, climate change as this, that's basically the first, you know, two presentations. Um, that could be pretty much what you can get about it, okay? Um, also you have the world, you are so big. I mean, this guy have like a two, between 20, 25% of the boat in the standard push 500 on average. They have 8% of all the companies in the world, listed companies. 
on average. So I mean, they have, if there is a problem, they have the problem. I mean, they cannot hide, they cannot you know, mani maneuver. I mean, they, they're gonna have the problem anyways, okay? But some people, some people, Beck Chuck, uh, 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 you know, perhaps the most pronounced uh, figure, they say it's impossible. You know, they compete on commissions. They don't have money enough to, you know, to be able to do that. They can vote with the feeds. I mean, they are indexed, so you cannot do anything about it. And you also can exploit uh, information advantages. Okay, so uh, on, you know, our answer, you know, basically based on other, you know, type of research, is like a, they not only compete in, in in commission, they also compete in returns. You know, you can invest. We were making the example before. You can really invest. Um, in active funds, or you can invest another, you know, uh, type of, of, you know, investment that is going to give you more money. So, and, and the most important ones, uh, which I think I would like to boost uh, now, is the uh, that has been uh, at least has been extremely successful because I have been asked this question in many different outlets. So I think that uh, we have to admit that you know uh, Harvard had a lot of power in terms of you know this this simple idea, you know, they're understaffed me. You know, they only there are only 45 people. You look to BlackRock, you look to the to the team doing this, it's impossible. They have thousands of companies, but you know, the problem is that's that's not true because you know they have in fact a, a, a proprietary database called Aladdin, in which those 45 people have a meeting which each of the active fund invest uh, managers of the fund, which are around 2,000 investment professionals. Okay, so they have a lot of information. That information that they get through the act, I mean, um, they are the biggest in passive investment, but they are also the biggest in active investment. Uh, they have 15,000 people invested, okay? They're biggest in everything, okay? So they have a lot of information. They centralize that information. Um, and this idea of the carbon emissions, you know, it's a cross-cutting issue, uh, like a governance, a sustainability. It's not that difficult to really, you know, you know manage that, that message across, okay? Um, um, also, you know, they can do it, as I said, because they have, you know, uh, there are people that vote, voters in, in most of on the, on the contest, uh, you know, the actual election, et cetera. So if they want, if they want, they can do it, okay? Um, um, also, you know, we have seen them that they are also increasing engagement with firms for the last, they're very active in the regulatory process. So there are many, doing many things, not only engage, engagement. So it seems a little on the surface that they may have some financial incentive and they may have the power to do it with not much cost. So this is what we try to, to look at. Um, you know, um, let, me, let me just make, a, I mean, we, the public is public, the paper is publicly available. So let me give a little bit of flesh uh, or what you will not find in the paper. It's a little bit more my personal takeaway of these things. So it's not in the paper, but let me give you a thing much, much more interesting that, that you know. So the, the biggest backlash to this approach is that whenever you have a vote, most of the times these guys vote against the, the managers. In, I mean, the managers vote against the shareholders' proposals when they are ready to climate change. In other words, they don't vote. Okay? No voting is voting against, right? So uh, for some people, that's a very a strong signal that they are green, greenwashing, you know. Uh, for that, um, in my view, that's a very extreme view. It may be the case that between, I mean, they, they have a, what basically they say, BlackRock and the other guys say, is that most of the shareholder proposal are done by, you know, nice people, but that know nothing about economics. You know, the shareholders, excuse me, the, the Nance in the Oklahoma, or these guys, super nice people, but they don't know. You know and they say, well, you have to stop, you know, uh, you know, petroleum uh, activities. Yeah, okay, whatever. Okay, so you, you basically, you know, nice, uh, nice proposal, but with no take, no serious enough. Uh, so that's why they vote again. And sometimes when they're serious, most of the time they manage to do it in advance. So that's why they say, you know, there's a little bit of, uh, and most of the proposals only happen in the US, a little bit in Europe, but it's not really worldwide, it's not that representative. Um, my takeaway of that is that, you know, you, you don't have to go all the way down. In my view, uh, what I will show in the paper is that, you know, they have done something. In my view, they haven't done everything they could. 
everything they could uh, for two reasons. Uh, in my view, the first reason is, is because it's costly. You know, this is in that Nirvana policy, right? You know, you can do, you know, climate change. Yeah, it's climate change. You know, it's a huge, yeah, huge reallocation of capital. It's amazing. I mean, you cannot do it really like a quickly. I mean, you have to be extremely careful. Um, um, and second, if you, if BlackRock and Standard State Street and um, Vanguard are very, very uh, forward, straightforward doing that, it's gonna happen. The same thing is happening with the with the with the Twitter and with the you know with the Amazon. They're gonna have a huge backlash, political backlash, because people think that they are a monopoly. You just show that you are doing something about it. But but that's the, that thing is good. Yeah, it's good now. But we'll see in the future what's happening. The same thing will happen with Twitter and, and Trump. If you have the power to shut down something for good, you have the power to shut down something for bad. So. I think they're kind of stuck in the middle. So they want to do stuff, but it's not really, they cannot do all the way down, okay? So- I mean, Can I ask you a question? Please. You, you were saying that many times these, uh, these large funds are, they vote against shareholder proposals uh, related to climate uh, changes. Uh, do you know what's the proportion of, of all these proposals that are submitted by them? Do they make any? No. Okay. No, no, no. So if, if they do anything about it, they do nothing. I mean, we can say they, in my view, I mean, uh, I think it's fair to say that they could do more. It's fair to say, I think, I mean, I cannot say the opposite. I think that you can do much more. They say that no engagement is better. That's the way to go. You know, uh, you know, most of the proposals are, you know, they have done something. I mean, they have done like a two or three, I think with uh, Exxon, um, I think, Two or three, you know, in, in the last, you know, five years. I mean, pretty much nothing. Um, yeah. Um, so this is the, the sample, you know, from 2005 to 2018, uh, MSCI, etc. Um, so um, let me just go. Try, I mean, basically, this the, what I want to show here. They have around, you know, all all of the three together have around five percent. Um, um, then they have, um, you know, across across the board, and also across industries, uh, countries, industries, etc. So they are not pretty much. I mean, they have the pretty much everything. No? They are not very tilted towards some some type of a company. Okay, so let me go to the two main results. I mean, um, the first result, uh, what we were looking at is the the engagements, which are, you know, most of the time they are physical engagements with the, with the CEO of the companies of the, you know, of, of the C-suits of the, of the companies, um, which you have this, this, this conversation. These are engagements related to climate change. So what we see is that, you know, they're more likely to engage with companies that have more emissions that are bigger uh, and which they have a more significant stake, okay? If you look at the, the Black Road State Street Vanguard is pretty much across the board. These are the three main results. Okay. Um, um, so now I, I'm going to make a jump, uh, you know, a little bit this coordinated in, in, in the logic, but I'm going to be looking at the, at the stake that the B3, this B3 have on the firms and what's happening with the, with the CO2 emission the following year. Okay disconnecting with the prior slide, okay? Just looking at that exactly, okay? So what we see is, you know, basically it's a reduction of the, of the CO2, okay? The magnitude is not huge. So <clears throat> it's around 2% if you increase one standard deviation. I mean, depending obviously, obviously of the coefficient. I mean, 2% is not much. I mean, it's a lot. It's not much. If you think about it that this is, um, you know, the, 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 the well, some studies are talking about we need around 5% per year. Um, um, and also this is happening, but you know, obviously this is within firm deviation. And we will see what happened in the following years. I mean, simple, when you reduce the first, you know, 2% is strong, you know, it's, it's like a, you know, being confined for five days, everybody can do it, simple. Once you want to be confined for the following 15 days, you know, I, I will see you. So I think that these results are kind of, in my view, not extremely costly for them to, for these companies to do it. 
So let me just make you know two two points here. Uh, what when we see this result over time, we, we do this progression per year. We see that you know most of the action happens at the you know around you know Paris Agreement, which is basically what I think we were funding, which are at the end. And the and the 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 result is stronger, which is in the the figure on the left, when they have more basically more um, uh, ownership. Okay. Um, so then we try to twist a little bit the data. You know, let's see if the you know the same thing, but we the big three with a non-negligible increase, which is more than one percent. You know the result. We break it down into Black Rose Stage 3, Vanguard, we see that the Black Rose Stage 3s are the ones that are driving the result. Vanguard is a little bit, you know, not, uh, um, I mean, they, they, they were late in the process. Um, you know, then you put a lot of, you know, fixed effects because obviously there is a lot of endogeneity here uh, happening. So we put, you know, uh, country, firm, country industry, industry year, size decide year, you know, many different ways to twist the data uh, to try to alleviate a little bit at least uh, the endogeneity, um, you know, pretty much the results are there. Um, so now let, let me try to to link the engagement with the with the result I I showed, which is basically what I'm doing here. What we're doing here is that you know um, we are using that regression on the on the probability of engagement. We're using it here the top quintile, top quartile, top tier style, and we're interacting this with the width three. So the more probably that you have, the basically the, the reduction is bigger, okay? So in the, in the, the more probability you have to be a target of the engagement, the, the bigger is the, is the reaction of the, the reduction of the, of the CO2 emissions. Um, we do something uh, similar here, which is, well, um, Let's look at the public commitments that they have. I mean, they have say, you know, we're serious about it. So let's look at the number of meetings that you have related to, to environmental. Let's see the voting, you know, if the guidelines you say anything, the number of votes. Let's see the CEO, CEO letter, the number of press releases about this topic, et cetera, et cetera. We sum all of that, which is pretty much pretty similar to like a two. Two or three points in the year. I mean, this is this variable is a little bit more, you know, smooth. But you could substitute this variable with, you know, uh, I think Black Roy says 2017. It says straight around 2014, 15, and Bangar pretty much the last year where they have been really publicly at least uh, committed to 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 be involved in engagement related to environmental. When you do that, you see pretty much this uh, that these results are. This interaction hold. Um, <clears throat> and, and well, no, fi finally, um, and this is just uh, for indigenous purposes, uh, we try to use the Russell uh, 1000 2000 reconstitution. This is the second stage. So the idea is pretty much when you move uh, between two thresholds. Um, Basically, you have a, um, uh, a boost in the in the amount of of, um, of shares, right? Or the proportion of shares that you have in, in these in these firms. Um, um, I mean, there are many ways to do this to do this regression. We have done like a two or three or four different ways uh, because there was a little bit you know discussion in the literature, but pretty much they are consistent across the board that there is a, 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 a basically a reduction on that. Um, so, okie dokie, uh, what else? So, um, so summary, uh, I will say, uh, we won't, we can conclude here, uh, gonna be very quick, I guess. Um, uh, the big three engage with firms with more emissions. The big three influence is associated with lower emissions. That pattern is stronger with higher engagement probability and higher public commitment. And the patterns suggest that big three influence plays a role in the reduction of corporate CO2 emissions. Okay, so I think that's it <clears throat> for me.
Just like your microphone is uh, closed. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's talking? Sorry, I had turned off my microphone. <laughs> One thing I, I was wondering, they don't submit shareholder proposals, and yet they manage to reduce uh, or the firms in which they invest or the funds manage to reduce CO2 emissions. So what's the channel that it takes? Is it by, I mean, if they don't submit shareholder proposals, how do they change things around? I mean. Yeah, basically what we call engagement are uh, uh, meetings that Blaro, the, the, the sustainability team has with the CEO team uh, in which basically they they show I mean or they explain uh, they ask questions about you know what they think is the are you know the climate change risk if you have you know incentive uh, what the your transparency policy about it etc cetera, etc cetera. So, so so basically I mean Larry Fink sends a letter every year in which they make clear what he thinks is important which is that's that's one channel. And the second challenge they have, especially they have meetings with companies. The question is, some people could argue that those meetings are is strong enough to convey a, a change. Um, that's an empirical question. So my, my understanding, you know, discussing with CEOs is that whenever BlackRock has a meeting, you want to listen. If someone has 8% of, of your company or in the US, 20% of your company, you want at least to listen why they want to do that. They're very reasonable. I mean, I guess uh, they say that eventually, eventually they go uh, um, and will vote against uh, directors, but that's not happening much. Mm -hmm. It's very, very rare occasions. So in my view, that's right now where, as I said before, right now we're in the very simple, easy way to reduce 2% of the, your carbon emissions. It's not that difficult. The problem is gonna be the following, the following 2%, 3%, in which you have uh, to reallocate capital. At that moment in time, uh, if they are serious, um, they basically, you know, they will have to, to impose more cost. Uh, that happened, for instance, with Exxon. I think it was Exxon, and the other one was, um, I don't have it here. Uh, I mean, they were, I have it in the paper. Exxon, another company, in which they were not paying attention to them. They, were, they didn't want to have even a meeting. So they, they say, okay, you know, enough is, is enough. So basically, they, they won the shareholder proposal in 2017. But yeah, that's that's uh, for you know fair point. Okay. In a sense, <laughs> I I find this a bit of a concern. In the following sense, in ESG you have governance. Now you're telling me these guys who may own five ten percent of the company, they basically short circuit. They don't they don't submit shareholder proposals to the vote. They basically short circuit the entire equity all the rest huh, of the equity holders to impose their preferences on management. And when you think on a corporate governance point of view, this is a bit uh, a bit of a concern because, uh, you know, coming back to what we did, the presentation we had before with Stefano, there seems to be sort of a shift from uh, investors' preferences to uh, managers. And then these guys, they seem to impose on firms or funds whatever they feel is good at that time, and which may change over time, actually. Totally, totally. I mean, we, we have a big problem, I think, uh, with the technological companies, and we have a huge problem with the with a BlackRock, Sistry, and Vanguard, because obviously they have they are pivotal in the U.S. They are pivotal in most of the most of the you know uh, contest. So pivotal voters. I mean, um, um, so yeah. Totally agree. Uh, and right now we have that this that idea of who are the guys. So you are even right now, you know, very generous. So some people could argue that you could extend that uh, idea to the stakeholders, client, customers, you know, employees. Who is the one that you have to give? You know, who are the ones that you have to give really preference to? Uh, you know, is the investor which type of investor? The CEO have to make a decision. So it's. Uh, that's why we have had this, uh, this you know, uh, academic clash for the last, you know, uh, I would say last year. So uh, honestly, I don't know. Uh, everybody likes like it when you are shutting down Trump. Uh, if you don't like Trump, or okay, I like when you are doing, you know, CO2 emissions. The problem is that you know, uh, who is telling you know which which is the 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 best way? And uh, we don't have really breaks, but that's that's reality. And that's the same thing happened with active ownership. 
you know, people that go there, they have 20%, they have, they get the sun seats and they change everything. So it's, I don't know. Okay, there's the other question. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I'm not sure that I, I followed all of the results. Thanks for the presentation, anyway. Uh, so, so my question was, um, would it be uh, possible if you didn't already do so to look at um, instances where these firm had a more of a controlling share of the firms compared to other instances? Would that be um, something that you presumably want to look at? Sure. Yeah, I mean, in the U.S., for instance, we, we look at the U.S. versus non-U.S. In the U.S., they have around 25% on average of the standard force. So, yeah, the, the result holds also for the U.S. Um, the, the thing is whether you really need to have a control. And what do you mean by control? Uh, you mean 30%? Well, I, 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 guess, I guess there are other papers. Uh, I forget the guy's name. Um, for the airline industry, when it shows that the, um, you know, the, the relation That's with up. competition and yeah, exactly. So what you could do presumably is to see if these effects are stronger um, in instances where uh, these um, owners are bigger compared to other earn owners within the company compared to other instances, right? Good, good point, yeah. Very good point. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's how it, I mean, we have done a little bit of that, but not exactly what you want, which I think is much more interesting. What we have done is looking at the at the increase, is the figure figure one, the increase in this is ownership, but you want to have the increase related to who are the other guy. Uh, um, yeah, um, also assuming that you are kind of a, a executing power, not influence. Which is exactly. I think they would make uh, the case stronger for you if you could find those types of results. No. Well, but one thing what you wish, another thing is reality. So, so you wish that they have power, and they exert the power. This is what you wish. Doesn't mean that's reality. So reality may be perfectly that they have power. They don't care. They just want to have a little bit of influence, a little bit of influence, but not big enough to disrupt the capital allocation. So it's, it's interesting. I'm not sure if it's what's it's gonna happen. So this is not are something- you, I, I use sure. the word power when I talk about the st statistics. <laughs> I think there's semantics here. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, but you say control, I mean, are you for it? Yeah, so my, my point is that you would like that they have more control, they're gonna do the best and the more control they have, they're gonna do more. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't believe that. Honestly, I think that this is kind of a huge disruption of capital and they're, they're, very, they're very soft. I mean, they're not, exercising all the power they have. They have a lot of power. Um, yeah, uh, um, to give you an example, I mean, we were discussing with them this paper. They have not been publicizing, publicizing this paper. Why? Because at the same time that you, you show this paper, the same co-author have the other paper. You know, power, you know, has a, a huge connotation for, you know, for when you have mon a monopoly. So, I mean, power control. So I don't know. I don't know what to find, uh, but, for sure, it's much more interesting what we have done. Uh, yeah, question? yeah, it's just a, a question. Okay. So, uh, you analyze uh, the commitment for I know for for climate for CO two, but in the U.S., the main let's say the main concern is governance, uh, not so much uh, climate. So, I mean they could be more concerned and more dedicated to vote in uh, governance issues, right? Then, you know, the climate mm -hmm. has not been in the, the, the US agenda does not have so much prominent role as it has in Europe, right? So, or even yeah. social, I mean, social was more like after the Well, I mean, I mean um, it was not clear uh, uh, when, when Obama was in power. I mean, I think if you look at the Obama, you know, basically, you know, the, the, the green bond funds were very, you know, going very well until Trump appeared. So the, that's why these ideas of returns, I, I never like it because it depends on the, when you see the, the green returns. But I think that in the US, uh, obviously when Trump arrived, uh, a lot of momentum lost, lost, I mean, we lost, I mean, they lost a lot of momentum. Still, you have the climate 100 plus, they have been super, um, I will say, super proactive on, on in press. I mean, you look at all the press yesterday, 
I was with the with the Wall Street Journal, were publishing this paper. I mean, a piece of the of the uh, a piece of opinion they were putting our paper, and the editor retracting, retracting that piece. You know why they're retracting? They don't wanna they don't wanna have anything positive about these guys. So um, I think there is a lot of uh, a lot of power that the press has on these issues. Um, these guys have been, I mean, the, the Climate 100 Plus has been very, very proactive on making the idea that these guys are not doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, um, um, in March 2017 was the first time that Larry Fink, um, there was a, a huge press uh, campaign in which they were saying that the BlackRock was not being very, very powerful, I mean, very pressing on climate change because they were they have a conflict of interest with the funds the mutual funds on their own firms so because you have a I mean you're the asset manager of the of the you're investing in the firm but you're also managing the the funds of the firm so because of that conflict of interest they wanted so that was a paper in general finance that have a lot of uh, momentum they put that paper they applied that paper to the climate change um, they have exactly the same the same result so Big, big, uh, uh, you know, financial time was the journal, everybody, everywhere. And Larry Fink in, in, in March 2017, he issued a, a letter saying, you know, listen, we're going to be serious about that. If you look at the, at the, of the uh, market reaction of that day, depending, I mean, you find a huge market reaction depending on, you know, whether you are basically owned by Larry Fink or not. So I think that, you know, this is, kind of important in the US as well. Um, at least we find the results. The things that regulatory risk, the regulatory risk decrease a lot with Trump. But we will, I think we will see something different uh, with Biden. So honestly, we don't have physical risk. We only have regulatory risk. That's reality. So physical risk, who knows? Regulatory risk super clear. So the, that's that's the, the huge problem we have with this uh, with this topic. Thank you very much. Other questions? Okay, uh, if there's no other question. First, I'd like to thank uh, the three presenters for very interesting papers for our first webinar. So I'm very very happy to have uh, to have you guys uh, presenting your your research. Of course, I'd like to do uh, to thank all participants. Uh, this is, as I said, our first time. We're preparing a second one, uh, also related to ESG issues. Uh, you'll be informed very quickly on this as soon as we uh, set up the program. So uh, thank you very much. I wish you uh, health, and you know, especially these days. <laughs> it's probably the best thing we can wish anyone now. Uh, and looking forward to see you at a next webinar. Thank you very much, and take good care.